<laughs> welcome. Welcome if you're watching online. I'm excited about this word, y'all. It's Life Group Launch Sunday. We celebrate this because of what life groups mean to this house, what they mean to the body of Christ global. Life groups are about us getting together with one another and sharing life with one another. It's where we get real with one another. We share our stories. We are discipled by the word of God when we sit down and we open the word together. Life group is where we dig in, where we pray, and where we share our stories. And so we celebrate that this weekend, but we, we didn't just come up with that here at Victory Life Church. We find life groups in Acts 2.42. If you will remember, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dwayne in his Immaturity series, Immaturity, the Trojan Horse in the Church, he mentions Acts 2.42, and he talked about how if we, like the first church, will commit to the four things that they committed to, we will experience the same fruit that they experienced. When they committed to this, these four Four things it says that people were added to the church daily exponentially it grew revival was breaking out the church was being birthed so the four things that they committed to was number one uh, the apostles doctrine that's the gospel of Jesus anybody in this room committed to the Word of God you committed, sold out to the gospel of Jesus. Well, they in their small groups, in their life groups, they gathered and they studied, they shared the apostles' doctrine, they shared the gospel. Some of them were able to share things that they witnessed that Christ did. They shared stories with one another. Can you imagine they were there? Well, we get to tell our stories of things that Christ has done in our lives when we sit down with one another and we share the gospel with each other. They committed to the breaking of bread. They shared meals with each other. Sharing a meal with somebody is an intimate, special thing, isn't it? You know, I like, what was it, Pastor Dwayne said, I don't get spaghetti in my beard for just anybody. That's an <laughs> intimate thing. I can totally attest to that. I don't get spaghetti between my teeth for just anybody. It's special. And not only do we break bread and we share a meal together, but we share the communion. We come to the Lord's table together. His broken body, his spilled blood, we partake of that as a family and in community. The other thing that they committed to was to fellowship. That is life group in a nutshell. It's fellowship. It's the sharing of the word, the breaking of bread and coming into relationship with one another. And the last thing they shared was the prayers. They shared prayer with one another. Now, I believe what the Lord has impressed upon me for this season, for our house, I believe the Lord has said, I want us to lean into the subject of prayer. Out of these four things today, we're gonna lean into the subject of prayer because I believe there is an invitation from the Lord for us corporately, for the body globally, to begin to lean in to prayer, corporate prayer, where we sit together, like what we did this morning when people raised their hands because they needed to receive healing. It says when we together lay hands on the sick, they recover. There is a call from the Father for us to begin to engage in prayer. So let's look at it afresh. There's new revelation, amen? There's more to prayer than we've previously known. There's always more. You crack open the Bible, any one subject you land on, there's always more revelation. So I wanna challenge you today to believe that the Lord wants to show you something fresh and that as you dig into the subject of prayer in the coming weeks and months, that the Lord is just stirring. He's doing a work on the inside of you. You know, Pastor Dwayne last week mentioned, and he's mentioned this a couple of times, that we as the body of Christ are experiencing a third great awakening. An awakening means an awakening of the church, an awakening of people to the presence of God where they begin to hunger for God. They hunger for Jesus. Well, if you study awake, the great awakenings of the past or any great revival, they were always preceded by a revival in prayer among God's people the prayers of saints coming together in agreement and releasing God's kingdom into the earth through their prayer. That is what the Father is inviting us to partake of in this season. So everybody with me? We're on the same page. We like, we like the invitation. Let's respond to this invitation. And I believe that the Lord has a word for you today. I wanna pray over it, Father. I thank you that Holy Spirit, you're speaking in this room that you are releasing assignments, you are releasing specific direction in this room, Father. I thank you, Lord, that you are releasing 
people who have had hangups about prayer in the past, where they went into the secret place of prayer, they began to engage in prayer, and they felt like their prayer was ineffective, where people have felt as if they have failed in the area of prayer, we break that today, Father, that we are going to be a people of prayer. You said that your house would be called a house of prayer. So we lean into the invitation. We stir up our zeal and our passion and our fire to commune with the King of Kings. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. So we are gonna be looking today at the Lord's Prayer and we're gonna break it into three parts just to help our flow. But before we get into the Lord's Prayer, I wanna share a story with you. So, um, you know, if you've been here for any time at all, you will have or begin to identify who the huggers are. The huggers. We're a special people, the huggers. Um, if you haven't been here very long, or if you're new, or if you're not a hugger, I just need you to know, they will find you, <laughs> and they will break you, okay? <laughs> I know because I am one. So if you see me coming, you better run, because you're probably gonna get hugged. Um, so being a hugger, this is a common experience that I've had is, um, that I noticed a couple weeks ago. So. It was a Wednesday night, I'd been on my hugging spree around the place and I returned to my seat right there and worship was about to begin. And if you're a hugger, this is normal for you. I began to notice I had picked up a lot of perfumes and colognes and assorted other smells just right here on my shoulders. <laughs> And if you're a hugger, that's just a part of it. That's a part of church culture nobody ever tells you about. You pick up some fragrances. And so I'm sitting right there and I'm, I'm smelling the smells and I'm trying to match smell to, who was that? Like match the smells to the person. <laughs> and as I'm doing this, I'm having this conversation, a little laugh with the Lord. I heard Jesus speak to me in that moment. He said, that's what I smell like. That's what I smell like. And I immediately saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, because the word says he ever lives to intercede for us. That means he's ever living to pray on our behalf. And I pictured him there at the right hand of the Father, and I saw his linen robes, and across his shoulders was the fragrance of the nations, the fragrance of every one of his children. And as he would smell and take in that fragrance, he would be reminded, oh, I need to lift this prayer up for my daughter, Kathy, or for my son, John. Oh, there was a constant reminder of the fragrance of his children right here on his shoulders. I want us to go to 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15. This is our key scripture. This was the scripture, the verse that the Lord dropped in my heart for today and for this season. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That line alone would preach. He always leads us in triumph. Always, not sometimes. He always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Everybody say fragrance of Christ. Fragrance of Christ. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. When we join in prayer corporately, there is this beautiful intermingling of fragrance. Your prayer joined with my prayer and it releases a sweet savor to the Lord. But not only is it released to the Father, but it's released to those around us, those who are perishing. And when they see Christ on you and I, a people that have been saturated in communion with the King of Kings, it's recognizable. You don't even have to open your mouth. You only need to walk into a room and there's a fragrance released. It's a supernatural thing that takes place and it draws the heart Heart of people because people want what Jesus has. People want the king and they are drawn to the king in you like a sweet smelling fragrance. So if you study fragrance in the Old Testament throughout the scripture, it's very interesting. There's a lot, the Bible has a lot to say about smells. It's very interesting. Um, but in the Old Testament specifically, you would see 
when um, a sacrifice is made, like a cow or a, a lamb, they, you know, the high priest, they would make these sacrifices, and it was the smell that went up to the Lord that pleased him. It's the same with the holy incense that was burned in the temple. It was a smell that was released that pleased the Father. Well, we see revealed in the New Testament what the Old Testament contained. And the New Testament, we see that this fragrance that pleases God points to one of two things. That fragrance either points to a revelation of Christ or the prayers of the saints a revelation of Christ or the prayers of the saints. There is an intermingling, again, of a revelation of Christ, the knowledge of Christ being released when we engage in corporate prayer. When we engage in prayer in our life groups, not only are our prayers being answered and are we seeing the manifestation of what it is that we pray, but we are also releasing Christ. When you pray over a stranger in town center, you've released the fragrance of heaven. You have released Christ in their life. And it's the power of Christ in their life that is gonna go on from that moment and transform them, amen? So let's look at prayer. We're gonna look at the Lord's Prayer again. I'm breaking it into three distinct parts just to help our flow. So the three points that we're going to get from this is, from the Lord's Prayer is to remain, to um, receive, and then to release. So I want you to just keep note of that. We're breaking it in three parts. But before we jump into the Lord's Prayer, I want us to look at a couple of things. The, it's, the Lord's Prayer is notated in Luke 11, and we see it again in Matthew 6. And for the most part, they're pretty much the same, but there's a couple of differences I want us to catch before we jump into it. In Luke 11, 1 through 4, it opens with the disciples coming to Jesus, asking them, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to know how to pray. And I find that so interesting because these are Jewish men, you know? They came from a tradition of prayer. They were raised in a heritage of prayer. Their fathers prayed, their fathers' fathers prayed, their fathers' fathers all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They come from a culture that knows how to pray. And yet they're coming after Jesus saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. And what I imagine them thinking is compared to your prayer life, it's like we know nothing. Have you ever been there? Like, I want a prayer life that looks like yours, Christ, because compared to your prayer life, it's like, I know nothing. And I imagine that they would witness Jesus go off by himself. It says in scripture, he went off to be alone with the Father all the time. He was always sneaking away from the crowd to spend time in prayer in communion with the Father. And the disciples are witnessing this. And then they, he would come back. He would return from that time of prayer and he would return walking on water. He would return feeding 5,000 with a little boy's lunch. He would return restoring lepers to health. He would return restoring blind eyes and restoring lame legs. He would re re return with power. He would restore people and it was as a result of his having gone off and being in communion with the Father. And the disciples are seeing this. We see that your prayer life is effectual. It's effective. Teach us how to pray like you pray. We want to, to come into every atmosphere bringing what Christ brought with him when he came. We are being called and invited to be a people of prayer who when we show up at Walmart, we too come with healing in our wings because Christ is on the inside of us, amen? So that's the invitation we're talking about today. In the other account, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Jesus begins by saying, in this manner, pray. Manner means method or technique um, with this practice or in this form, pray. So what he's about to show them is context that they can apply and bring into their prayer life every day. You take what I'm showing you in this moment, dig out the revelation in this prayer that I'm giving you and apply this to your prayer life daily. So that's the invitation. So part one or number one of the Lord's Prayer we're gonna look at is to remain. These first five things that the Lord professes, the first five phrases, these are things that we remain in, we soak in. 
So there's this chicken dish that I make, y'all. <laughs> we're going to talk about food for a minute. I'm getting ready. Anybody else? But anyway, um, so I make this chicken dish and I throw, you know, how many, however many sticks of butter. I don't need to tell you. I put my butter in there. I sprinkle my ingredients. I got all these Italian seasonings. I love it. And I pop it in the oven. And the longer it bakes in the oven and the longer those flavors marry one another, the more fragrant that meal becomes. And my household knows it's ready because it's become so fragrant. The fragrance has filled the space. And that's as true of anything that I bake. When it's done, when it's ready to partake of is when it's its most fragrant. This is what the Lord is saying. Remain in these things so you can be your most fragrant. You're most fragrant. I want you to return to these things daily. These five things need to always be operating in your prayer life. And it needs to become so natural, it's like breathing air. You don't even think about them. It's just become the way you commune with the Father. So number one, we remain in relationship. This comes from the phrase, our Father in heaven. I believe that this phrase is the most important phrase Christ utters, and that's why it's the first. If we cannot profess and call God Abba, Daddy, Father, from a true place of conviction in our hearts, if we don't know He's really our Dad, if we don't live from that revelation, then every other word of prayer we utter is insubstantial. It's unfounded. Every bit of our communion is founded on this understanding that he is my dad and I am his child. That's how we approach God. He's not some distant being and he's not Santa Claus that we throw lists up to. He's daddy. He's Abba. And we talked about a few weeks ago how the word Abba means it carries intimacy and also obedience. Because he's my father, I share a special bond with him and I obey him. It's a special relationship. And this is huge because this was the point of the cross. So let's just begin there. All of the Old Testament, God is looking to dwell with his people. He wants to dwell with us. He wants to be with us. But because of sin, he can't come close and man can't come close to him. So he sends Christ to the cross and Christ's blood atones for our sin. And so now the sin issue is removed when I call upon Christ as my king. And when I receive the blood of Jesus, I'm made a vessel now of the indwelling Holy Spirit who takes up permanent residence on the inside of me. And because he's taken up permanent residence on the inside of me, it is proof that I have been made a child of God. Amen. Amen. Galatians 4, 6 says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. When I approach the Lord and I talk to him, throughout the day. It doesn't have to be always just to set aside quiet time in my office by myself with no interruptions. It's while I'm doing dishes. It's while I'm on the road. It's when I'm walking through Walmart. I'm talking to the Father. <laughs> Sometimes I, I have to work on that um, because I was praying on my front porch one day and my neighbors showed up and thought I was a little weird. So watch that, be mindful of things like that. But you can talk to the Father at any time on the basis of Him being Daddy, Him being your best friend. He has a personality. God's funny. He wants to be known and He wants, he wants to share life with us on the basis of His being Father and us being child. Amen? Amen? Number two, the second phrase in the Lord's Prayer is, hallowed be thy name. I have equated this to remaining in the Spirit. For, because in order for God's name to be hallowed among us, hallowed means we make your name holy. We recognize that you are holy. We recognize that you are revered. We respect you. You are holy. In order to hallow his name, we must be holy ourselves. If his name is going to be hallowed among us, we have to respond to this invitation to live a life of holiness. Well, good news is <laughs> you don't have to do that in and of your own power. 
because how many know we can't achieve that in and of ourselves? I don't know about you, but I don't have some high priest killing heifers on my behalf, <laughs> you know? We have a Holy Spirit. We have a King of Kings who has accomplished holiness for us on our behalf. He has made us holy. He says, you are righteous and truly holy. So be holy as your father is holy. We have to come into alignment with what has been accomplished in our spirit. True holiness, true righteousness has been accomplished on the inside of us. Now as a response to it, I through partnership with the Holy Spirit, I live holy. I walk holy. I let him teach me what that looks like. So a scripture that we go to for that is Romans 8, 5 through 6. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In our prayer life, we set our minds on the things of the spirit. This should occupy a lot of your time in prayer. A lot of your communion with the Father should look like setting your mind. We have to train our mind. We have to bring our minds under submission to the Spirit. Your communion time with the Father is where that happens, where you train your mind to be mindful of those things of the Spirit, not the things of the flesh. Amen? We can do this. <laughs> That's good. Okay, next one, kingdom-oriented. We remain kingdom oriented. This comes from the phrase, thy kingdom come. This is important because I don't know about you, I'll throw myself under the bus. For me, for years and years, my prayer life looked like building my kingdom. Like I wanna shape my kingdom. My prayer life is me talking to the Lord about all of my plans and what I want to do and what I want to have and when is this going to happen and when is this going to unfold and that began to shape my communion with him. But the Lord's invited us to something higher. He's saying, not your kingdom, let's focus on my kingdom. I want to know what God is doing, what his plans are, what his focus is. And out of focusing on his kingdom and what he's doing, the call and the gifts of God on my life will automatically follow. They will automatically be fulfilled. So if you find that your prayer life is occupied by a lot of building your kingdom, you've got to re orient. And we have to do this daily. I have to do it daily. When, when my, my thing, what I've got going, takes up all my communion time with the Lord, it's an indicator. It's time to reorient around his kingdom. Luke 12, 31 through 32 says, but rather seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. And I love this. It says, fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give us the kingdom. And we get to experience that when we commune with him in prayer. So let's be oriented. Let's be a people oriented about around what he is doing. And when we do that, we will see effortlessly what our role is and what he is desiring to accomplish in the earth. Amen? Everybody okay? I want to check on you. Okay, it's a lot. <laughs> Y'all let me know if I need to slow down. I can talk fast. How am I doing, Pastor Terry? Good. All right. <laughs> the next one is we remain attentive to his heart. This is my favorite one. This comes from the phrase in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. His will can be known. He wants to communicate to us his will. His will means his desires what's in his heart for us, for our nation. He wants to communicate what's in his heart. And this is such an in, uh, invitation into intimacy. This one especially ministers to me. This keeps me on track. Asking the Lord this question, when I begin my prayer day, when I sit down or when I'm in conversation with him, I ask him, Lord, what's in your heart? Lord, what is in your heart? Because it's hard to be selfish, to be greedy, or to be in pride when I am asking him what's in his heart. It's like when I go on a date 
with my husband or when you're with your spouse, you want to ask them, how are you doing? (laughs) You don't want to occupy the entire conversation with everything about you. No, you, you ask them, no, what is in your heart? How do you feel? What has your day been like? And for me, I feel like that's such a sweet invitation to know that God wants to communicate to me what's in his heart. And to desire to know that, only sons, that's a, that's a son thing. Everybody say that's a son thing. <laughs> we're sons, we're daughters. Wanting to know what's in father's heart, that's a son thing. It's a special thing to say, whatever's in your heart, I wanna be a part of making that happen. Whatever you're desiring, Lord, let me be a part of making that happen. That's a beautiful prayer. And for me, that reorients me around all the things we're talking about, relationship with him, his kingdom. Psalm 25, 14 is one of my absolute favorite uh, scriptures. Read it in every translation you get your hands on. It's beautiful. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. In other words, um, with fear him, that's revere, respect. You could say the secret of the Lord is with his sons. And he will show them his covenant. He'll show them his desire, what he wants. Another translation I absolutely love says that there is a secret place for the lovers of Yahweh where they sit and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. Isn't that beautiful? There's a secret place for the lovers of Yahweh where they sit and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. Look that scripture up. That's a refrigerator scripture. You're welcome. (laughs) Next one, a willing vessel. We want to remain a willing vessel. This comes from the phrase on earth as it is in heaven. So God is active in the heavenlies. His nature, his way of doing things, his thoughts, love, goodness, mercy, peace, righteousness, all of these things are active in the atmosphere of heaven. Well, he wants to get the atmosphere of heaven here on the earth. He wants to manifest his nature, his character, his way of doing things. He wants to get everything in the heavenly realms, everything in his presence, in his manifest presence, he wants to bring here. Well, how does he do that? How, what is the way, what is the path? I want you to look around and see if you can find any way that he does that in the room. It's through us. We are the vessels of how he manifests what is happening in the heavenlies on earth. It's fulfilled through us, the prayer, your kingdom come. His kingdom is coming through you and I. That's why he filled us with his spirit so we would be adequate vessels to let his kingdom, his will, his way of doing things flow in and through us. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have a treasure that has been given to us that we have a responsibility to release in the earth. Okay, here's a story, a little confession. So (laughs) a couple years ago, I was at Walmart. I joke a lot about Walmart, y'all, because it's my least favorite place on the earth. I I would go anywhere. If you can make it at Walmart, you can make it on any mission field on this planet. I am convinced. And so a, a while back, I was there, I was in Walmart, and I'm one of those people who I'm really tempted to just put on headphones and just walk around really focused, like, don't look at me, don't look at me, just go. But I make myself engage with the people because there's some people at Walmart who need deliverance, amen? amen. They need what we got. And so I try to be mindful of that and pray myself up before I go in, get ready, get ready to minister. And so one day, I'm in Walmart, I just need to grab a few things, Lord. Just let me get in and out. Just need a few things. And so I got my list. And one of the things I needed was flowers. I like to have a a lot of flowers. So I went, I put flowers all around the house. I grabbed a bouquet and I knew the Holy Spirit said, grab another. I just knew he did. I didn't know what the plan was. was Like maybe I'll bring them to my mom. I don't know. So I grabbed two bouquets. I'm like, okay, I've got my bouquets. And I made it through Walmart safe. (laughs) I checked out, I'm walking out the door and there's these two women by the door and the Holy Spirit says, stop and talk to them. And I was like, no, 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 no. 
And I get out of there. I'm out of here, Jesus. I ask somebody else to do it. And I'm walking to my car, and he's like, you better get your tail back in there and go talk to those two ladies. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I turn around, and I walk in there. And I don't know what I'm going to say to these women. And so I just come up to them, and I have these flowers. And so I'm like, you know, I just believe that uh, I'm supposed to give you these flowers. And so I hand them to these, this woman. It's, a, it's a, an elderly woman and her daughter. And they both begin weeping. And the, the daughter takes me aside, and she said, my mom just got some devastating medical news. And she, you don't know how much she needed this. And I'm, at that point, I'm crying too. Like, oh, God, thank you for the flowers. But um, we, um, we gathered in that moment, and we prayed. We got to pray over her mom. We got to speak life over that situation. The Lord has encounters like that for us absolutely everywhere. There are encounters like that in this room right now. There are people who need what you've got. And if there's people in here that need what you've got, of course there's people out there that need what you've got. They need you to bring a bouquet to release the fragrance of heaven into their lives and in a divine appointment where you come into a situation and you speak Father's heart over their situation. You speak love and you come into agreement with them for what they're believing for in prayer. There's opportunities like that everywhere. We just simply have to be willing. Well, the place of prayer and communion with the Father is where we teach our souls to come into alignment with his will. My flesh did not want to be talking to anybody at Walmart, like, get me out of here, Lord. <laughs> but my spirit is willing. So how do I bring my flesh into submission to my willing spirit? I do it through communion with the Father. The more you commune with the Lord, the more you will be ready, the more you will be willing to begin to reach out to people. If you're scared, if you feel that inkling in a store, the Lord says, go pray for that person. And your first response is, no, 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 <laughs> not me, Lord, send Pastor Terry. Then I would... I would wager that that is not a boldness deficiency, that's not a power deficiency, that's not a lack of Holy Spirit, it's a lack of communion with the Father. The more you commune with him, the more willing you are to do what he asks. That's the secret of obedience. You don't have to beat yourself over the head with trying to obey, that's miserable. If you wanna obey him, sit down and have coffee with your dad. Talk to him, open up his word, ask him, dad, what's on your heart? That's how you become willing and obedient vessels. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're gonna book it a little bit. I'm gonna try to pace myself because I booked it last time and I went a little too fast. But a little note is when we, prayer becomes more about the Father and less about you, that is when your prayer life gets exciting. Not only exciting, but effectual. When your prayer life becomes more about the Father and less about you, that's when you step into a place of praying effectually because you are learning the will of God and you have aligned yourself with what's in his heart. You've oriented yourself around his kingdom. So we talked about what we remain in. We remain in these five things. We remain in relationship, in the spirit. We remain kingdom oriented. We remain attentive to his heart and we remain a willing vessel. And this is what we soak in. And the more we soak in these things and return to these things and the more active these things are in our prayer life, the more fragrant we become. I wanna be a person who when I walk into Walmart, the atmosphere changes. Did you hear Pastor Duane share about how the, when men of God would walk in a room, people would just begin to weep? That is the evidence of a person who has stayed in the presence and communion with the Father. And that is what the Lord is calling us to experience corporately and in our life groups, that we as a body, Victory Life Church in Sherman is going to be a people saturated by the presence of the Lord. We're gonna be a fragrant people, amen? Number two, or part two, is what we receive 
And I want you to notate that everything that we receive comes out of everything we just talked about. You know, a lot of people, their prayer life is all about what they receive, what they need, what they can get. And you think that is my prayer life. I go to the Father, I ask him what I have need of, and that's biblical, but that's not everything. Everything really boils down to relationship and communion with the Lord. And if we can get that right and not get those things out of place, it's relationship first and out of relationship, my needs are met. For instance, my oldest daughter, Adani, she's five now. When, you know, she wakes up in the morning and she runs to find me in the house. I'm the one who tucks her in at night. If she needs food, if she needs money, she don't know what money is, but she knows if she needs it, I've got it. If she needs crafts, if she needs snuggle time, she runs to me because I'm her parent. She runs to her father because he's her dad. She runs to us because she knows everything she has need of is met by virtue of our being her parents. It's because we're her parents that her needs are met. A lot of us hope that this God we don't really know will please meet our needs, but he says, no, it's because I'm your father that I will meet your needs. So our prayer life, when we go to the father, that's where we can go to receive our inheritance. Prayer is where we go to receive every good thing in Christ from God. In our communion time, we don't go begging because we don't have to beg. We're sons. Sons do not beg. Orphans beg. We are sons. And we tell the Lord, we ask the Lord what we have need of, and he gives it to us freely. Why? Because we're children. So number one, there's, before I go into it, there's four phrases in the Lord's prayer. Give us, forgive us, lead us, and deliver us. These four phrases. These encompass everything that we need. He gives us, it says he gives us his daily, uh, our daily bread. That's our portion. That's everything we have need of, he gives us. If he, we need healing, if we need some financial provision, if we need peace, whatever it may be, it's provided for in him. Lamentations 3.24 says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. If I've got the Lord, then I've got everything I need. Number two, it says, forgive us. This is important on multiple levels. You know, um, when I make a mistake, because we all do, anybody ever made a mistake? <laughs> when, I get, when I get tripped up or get in the flesh or frustrated or lose my temper, I have trained myself to run to the Father immediately. I, I talk out whatever I need to talk out with a person that I've, I've offended or who has offended me, but I run to the Father immediately. I bring that thing before him so that I can receive mercy. I receive his forgiveness immediately. Why? Because when I receive forgiveness, it keeps our line of communication open. Remember when Pastor Jacob talked about being face-to-face? -face? We want to keep face-to-face -face with the Father. So anytime we get tripped up and failing, we run it to the Lord. And the other reason why this is important to us is because we are called ministers of reconciliation. That's our job. That is our ministry, essentially, is to reconcile all people unto God, to point them to God. But if we aren't, if we don't know that we're forgiven, if we're walking in condemnation and the enemy is beating us up with mistakes that we've committed and we're not freely receiving of the forgiveness of Christ, how can we fulfill our ministry as reconcilers? We have to go to the Lord on a regular basis and receive his forgiveness if we need it and to live free of any and all condemnation from the enemy. Amen? Amen. Next one is he leads us. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. I love this one. He leads us not into temptation. He leads us. He doesn't lead us to fail. He leads us to thrive. When I sit down, for example, to create a budget, I am communing with the Father. I'm asking the Lord how to allocate my budget. I'm asking the Lord where I can give, how I can give. And we are communing. He is leading me in how to take care of my budget with uh, wisdom. And that's with 
everything that I do in traffic, when we're making a grocery list, when we're talking to a child that's turned away from the Lord, he will lead and direct our conversation. He will give us wisdom in the moment, live action wisdom right there for us as we're communing. You can be having a conversation. How many know you can be talking to somebody right in front of you, but hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and responding and having an internal conversation with the Lord while you're having an outward conversation with the person. And he will actually lead you in conversation with that person, how to minister to them, how to love on them, how to help meet a need that they have. He leads us and we get to experience this on a daily basis. It's at our fingertips through communion with him. The next one is he delivers us. Ephesians 6.12, it says he delivers us from evil. Ephesians 6.12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling with each other, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is important to note that uh, we are not each other's enemy. The people at Walmart, Lord help them, they're not our enemy. But there are spiritual principalities. Our enemies are lust, greed, pride, lack, poverty, sickness, disease, uh, jealousy, envy. These are our enemies. So if at any point in your life you get tripped up on one of these things, anybody gotten tripped up on any of those things? You bring those before the Lord and he delivers you from all your enemies, from all your oppressors. If you struggle with gossip, bring that mess into the secret place with the Father and he has deliverance for whatever enemy we may face. If there's sickness and disease that has come against your body or against your family, he is deliverer and there is healing in his wings. This is a part of our inheritance. Amen? Now, prayer is how we access our inheritance. Number three, our last point, we talked about what we remain in. And if we remain in these things, we also receive what we receive from the Father. Lastly, this is what we release. We release his kingdom, we release his power, and we release his glory. This is revival. This is the great awakening Pastor Duane's talking about. When a people saturated with the presence of God begin to just live their life, they release his kingdom, his power, and his glory. Congregations that are sustained by prayer sustain revival. In closing, I wanna share with you a little story, okay? One more story. There's this precious woman, um, she's my friend from the Durant location. She's a worship leader at Victory Life Church in Durant. Her name's Jessie Salee. Anybody know Jessie? Her and I are actually related. We're cousin-in-laws. She's my husband's cousin. She's a precious woman. She's anointed, has the voice of an angel, and she's a wonderful minister. And um, she was telling me this story that she was on a trip to Nicaragua. And while she was there, the little children uh, were coming up to Jessie because she smelled so good. They were in a very impoverished village and they had never smelled perfume. And Jessie smelled delicious. They were just after her like, what is that smell? And so the next day she went out to minister, she brought her bottle of perfume with her. And when the kids would come up to smell her, she'd spray them with <laughs> some perfume. She said she ended up spraying over a hundred little kids in this village in Nicaragua. They're all running around with Jesse's perfume on. And I thought, what a beautiful picture of the church, of what we are called to do as the body of Christ, to share the fragrance of Christ with any and all who want to come and partake of it. So I'm asking you this weekend to go out and to be smelly Christians, okay? <laughs> Just let it rip, let it go, and release the fragrance of Jesus, okay?